by the following <laughs> that identify the following obstacles to women developing sustainable and rewarding careers at the bar. And those problems are work allocation, including lead work opportunities, client briefing practices, difficulties returning to practice after maternity leave, bullying, harassment, and discrimination, barriers in progressing to silk, uh, and power structures, which uh, the Bar Council believe is uh, male dominated. So that is the background and the, the, the key um, issues. And what about the data in relation to income? The 2021 report compared earnings data since uh, 2020 and found that, and I'm quoting, there has been an increase in average gross fee income for both women and men at the bar, but the gap between the average income has increased over the last 20 years. And it shows that overall, uh, the women are earning less than men in all areas of practice, except uh, family children law, which is my practice in fact. As a result of that data in 2022, the Bar uh, the, uh, Institute, the, the Inns of Court Alliance uh, had an event which was focused on the, identifying the problem. Uh, and it is fair to say that at the end of that event, all agreed that the gap needed to be addressed. And there were six key building blocks which emerged from that event. And those key building blocks are to collect and interrogate the data, to use the data to inform and strengthen individual practice management, to encourage diversity in chambers and in the instruction of diverse members, to monitor work allocation to ensure fairness, to support parental leave with best practice to ensure practitioners returned and returned to sustainable practices and to close the income gap. Well, that was the takeaway from March, 2022. So how are we doing? November last year, the Bar Council published its report on gross earnings by sex and practice area at the self-employed bar. And I'm afraid those figures, which is what brings us to this event, make for dismal reading. The key findings are these. In every core band and every area of practice, men's median gross earnings are higher than women. The disparity in gross income between sexes is present from the very start of the career and quickly increases. So the idea that it is because women take time off to have their children is completely dispelled. And the gap is particularly acute between 11 and 15 years of call. Women silks earn on average 71% of what the male, their male colleagues um, earn. Um, Whilst men and women's gross income earnings have both slightly increased over the last year, the gap between them hasn't narrowed. Uh, and uh, for most call bounds, the income, so the intersectional issue becomes more acute because across the call bounds, the medium income for black and Asian barristers is less than the medium for white barristers. Asian KCs earn more than white female KCs, but less than white male KCs and black cases earn 44% um, less than white cases overall. Not at all good. The INS of Court Alliance for Women wishes to build on this data and the various toolkits to support heads of chambers and senior clerks to develop pract practical solutions to the challenges that I've set out. And I have this afternoon a strong panel of speakers who will each tell us something about what they are doing in their spaces, what can be done generally, and to assist those who want to improve. And the panelists are Suzanne McGibbon, who is the Treasury Secretary and Permanent Secretary at the Government Legal Department. Mark Rushton, who is the Senior Clerk at Pump Court Tax Chambers. Will McKinley, who is the Chambers Director at South Square Chambers and Sharon Blackman, OBE, who is the Global Head of Services Legal at Citibank. I'll start with Susanna, who was here at the event in March 2022 as a bit of a segue from then to here, yeah. who I hope can set out what has been done, what has changed, and something of what the Government Legal Department are doing. Yeah, thanks very much, Barbara, and uh, lovely to see everybody. Um, as a major instructor of the self-employed bar, 
I think it's important for the government and the government legal profession to be uh, at the forefront of setting an example in the fair allocation of work. We're responsible for the conduct of some of the highest profile litigation uh, before the courts. We're the single biggest user of the Supreme Court. Uh, and as I say, I think we've got a major role to play in setting an example. I'm also responsible for running the council panels on behalf of the Attorney General. And it's important, of course, uh, that we there operate the highest standards of fairness and inclusion. I've also checked in with my CPS colleagues uh, before coming this evening to share what they've been up to in this space as well. But just to pick up on that link to the previous event, if any of you were here on that occasion, you will recall that I said how shamed I was as the then head of litigation in the government legal department, uh, that I realized that the council team in the Miller One case before the Supreme Court was the, for, the, for, for the team for the government was the only one that was all white male. Uh, so how have we improved? Well, I was a little bit relieved, I have to say, when I popped into the Supreme Court to watch the Rwanda, uh, watch a bit of the Rwanda case, that things had improved slightly, but not enough. Uh, we did have a more mixed team of counsel. So what are we doing to build on what I think is something that we still need to uh, do better? As an organization with a great internal track record uh, of diversity and inclusion, uh, most of our senior roles are now held by women for the first time ever. Um, we still must do much better in our use of the self-employed bar. We talked a lot last time about data, and as uh, we've already heard, data is one of the big planks uh, for how we make an improvement on this. And when we recognised that two years ago, I did some more digging internally, uh, and it quickly became clear that the data we were collecting only told us half a story. And particularly, I, it struck me as I dug deeper, went behind the, uh, the obvious, how uh, sometimes how percentages can be, uh, can, can be misleading because the Attorney General's fat panels percentage-wise, are far more diverse than the bar at large. In terms of the work that is distributed across the Attorney General's panels, percentage-wise, uh, it is far better than is often reflected in the, in the reports. However, um, if you dig behind it, what we saw was actually, in percentage terms, we were losing women at more senior levels. So we start at 50-50, on the panel C, uh, the first entry level panel, but then women are being put off applying to the more senior panels. So my solution uh, for, for the first thing to do is look behind uh, the obvious data and try to unpack what it's really telling you. What, what is it really telling you? Not just percentages. Um, so having been concerned about that, uh, we, held a round table for many of our um, female panel council uh, to interrogate just what we thought was going on. And there was clearly there some, you know, it confirmed some of my concerns about the way in which we build teams, the way in which we uh, develop council that we use on a regular basis. But it also demonstrated to me how some misperceptions were perpetuating. And that itself is unhelpful. So it comes back to not just having the data, not just interrogating it internally, but publishing it and making sure we explain what we are seeing. The other solutions uh, I've identified over the last two years are one which is maybe, maybe not a new solution, but something that's really important, which is to continue doing well what we do well so our appointments to the panels uh, are fair and open, and I'm satisfied that the ratios work well, and we carefully monitor that 
and we will continue to do so. GLD working practices themselves, as I've said, we're internally a very diverse and inclusive organisation. I think our working practices mean that we work well with women at the bar, whether they're juggling family caring responsibilities, whether they're returners uh, and whether they um, uh, and the work that they're doing. So I think that is a really important thing for those uh, organisations that may not be as diverse internally may need to learn how better to work with people uh, with other responsibilities. It's also true to say that many of our colleagues in government, if we call them our clients, expect to see diverse council teams. And that's quite a good lever to use with uh, clerks and with chambers. And that's something we have been doubling down more on. We've also done a lot of work to bust the myth that we only rely on a handful uh, of favored chambers where actually we've got well over 100 chambers represented on our panels. But I'm still concerned that in practice terms, when individuals are choosing who to instruct, that that, in, that complacency around what we do really well isn't translating into amb ambition to doing even better. So what does work? And we really do need to learn from others. And this is where the CPS come in because the CPS have a public advocacy strategy acknowledging the need to, uh, for their advocates to reflect the society we serve. They've also done a lot in recent years, working with the Bar Council, I know, to develop toolkits to increase a, a fair allocation. And one of the key expectations is to increase the declaration rates of council who are applying to the panels. So some really good things there that I think we all could learn from. And then above all, I would say most recently, I think it was in 2022, uh, the CPS launched the Treasury Council Pathway, which is a 12 month positive action scheme for advocates who have the potential to become Treasury Council in the future, um, particularly those from underrepresented groups. So really important work that's uh, underway already. I'm sure we'll have lots more questions, but ultimately for me, the key has to be transparency, transparency of intention, transparency of data and transparency where we're held to account. So I can hold my lawyers to account and you can hold me to account. Thank, thanks very much, Susanna. Scrap for the brief and scrap for your time. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to turn to um, uh, Mark McKinley and Mark, Mark, Will McKinley and Mark Rushton, who will do a bit of a, a double act, I hope, on the <laughs> practical step that Chambers can take to address um, some of these issues. Thank you. I want to begin by making a bold assumption. My assumption is that 98% of barristers and staff in Chambers support the concept of fairness and equal opportunity. Now, if that statement holds true, why after so many years are we still having conversations about earnings disparities? Somewhere along the road between intention and implementation, there seems to be a blockage. Some of you will be more advanced in your monitoring of and response to these disparities, others less so. Whatever stage you're at, I hope that this evening, Mark and I can provide you with a few thoughts and ideas that will stimulate discussion later on. I'm going to look at individual and organizational behavior. Mark will then talk about communication and in particular, the importance of practice reviews. I'll then cover some of the practical steps Chambers can take to make sure work is fairly allocated. And then Mark is gonna talk about visibility of earnings. I want to start by looking at individual behavior, but before doing so, it's worth reminding ourselves what we're trying to achieve when we kick off a project to reduce earning disparities in chambers. At its most basic level, we're trying to change behavior and we should bear this in mind throughout the process we're embarking on. Why do I say this? Well, however, however much I may outwardly support a project like this, one of my strongest survival instincts is to avoid change, because change creates risk and uncertainty. As a junior barrister, 
I may worry about how proposed changes could affect my earnings and my chances of getting lead work. As a KC, I may fear that this project will impact on my ability to select the junior barristers that I want to lead. And as a senior clerk or a practice manager, I could be concerned about a number of things. How am I going to resource this project? How will the barristers respond to any changes we implement? And how is it going to change the way I work and the way my teams work? Now, it may be that everyone in your chambers embraces change, but the point I want to make is that we shouldn't be surprised if some don't. We are all programmed to cling to the status quo and we should be understanding if people are worried by changes. It's a natural defense mechanism. If we want our barristers and staff to be comfortable about change and taking on risk, we need a culture that encourages this. If our culture values openness and promotes learning, and if we are forgiving when mistakes are made, then our people can be confident they will be listened to and they will engage in this project without fear or favor. Mark's now going to talk about practice reviews. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think it's important for us all to realise, first of all, that the things we're talking about means we are, or chambers are, going to have to invest time, possibly money, in staff and training. That said, IBC and the LPA, LPMA sorry, offer lots of training for free or at literally minimal cost. But what we have discovered is that there's not many chambers that have representation on those committees. We all need to be giving our people the skills and time they need to learn what is required for us to create proper communication or a way for us to start the conversations that are definitely required within our sets. Practice reviews and development meetings for me are essential. I must caveat this by saying I've only ever worked in the self-employed bar. I imagine the employed bar would have its own appraisal systems, uh, but I hope what I'm gonna say will relate in some form. As I say, practice meetings are vital. Anyone that's managing practices needs to know what your barristers or your people want. You need to know how they want to work and you definitely need to know what their expectations are. How you set them up is down to chambers. It's gonna be your management committee, whether that's your senior clerk or whether that's your team leaders. There was a report released last year by the Young Bar Committee which confirmed that over 20% of young barristers have never had a practice meeting and only 50% had had one. So we did ask some questions before you all arrived. Uh, I'm actually really pleased to say out of the 105 responses, 75 of you said that you've had one practice meeting or you conduct one practice meeting a year. 35 of you said there were two. Only 73 of you discussed money, which is obviously the reason why we're here. Any practice meetings that we hold, they need to be structured properly. Clerks need to be putting in notes and they need to be sending appendices or tables of earnings or opportunities, whatever you do for your meetings in advance to the barrister. That barrister needs a chance to have a look at the information and think about what they want to ask and how we can deal with the problems if there are any. And I'm not saying that every set has problems. There are resources out there such as the Bar Council's Guide on Getting the Most Out of a Practice Review, which was put together in conjunction with the LPMA and the IBC, and the Chancery Bar have just released their, released their Fairness Charter. All of these have different stages you can put in a practice meeting. For me, I think you need to talk about money. I think you need to let people know what they've earned over the last, say, three, four years, and you need to ask them what it is they expect to achieve financially. You, need can look, you can then put, potentially set targets for work done or payments. You would need to talk about age debt and cash flow because no disrespect to any barristers in the room, cash flow seems to be a bit of a problem most of the time. <laughs> and you need to go through their, uh, <laughs> you need to go through the areas of work in which they're working and where they're earning their money. You also need to think about how the barrister wants to work. So you should be asking, in my view, are they happy with the area they're working in? Are there areas they want to develop? How do they want or need to work? And that could be hours a week or days a month. And actually these days we need to ask whether they want to come into chambers or whether they're working from home most of the time. 
because that will affect your communication on how you communicate with that barrister. You should be discussing marketing, what they've done. You should be giving forward ideas, I think, from the clerkroom on what they should be doing to increase their visibility. And you need to find you need to find out how they want to do it. Do they like social events? Do they like writing articles? Do they like giving talks? If they're anything like me, the talk bit won't be the, what they want. Uh, future aspirations as well. Why are we only talking about the next year when we should be talking about the next five and ten? So set some goals. Definitely make sure these meetings are recorded so that both the barrister and us can actually have a reference point to what we want to achieve. And we can also put timeframes on any actions we might agree on. I'm going to hand over to Will now on the fair allocation. Okay, if we're going to embark on a review of our allocation of work, we should start with an understanding of the rules. Uh, rule 10, 110, which I'm sure you all know um, in the BSB handbook, is focused on equality. It states that if you're a self-employed barrister, you are responsible for ensuring that the affairs of your chambers are conducted in a manner which is fair and equitable. It goes on to say that this includes, but it's not limited to, the fair distribution of work opportunities. It's clear to me that if we fail to ensure that work is distributed fairly across chambers, we can very quickly bump into the Equality Act. Before we review our fair allocation of work process, there are a few questions we should consider. Has our management committee signed up to the review? This is going to need buy-in from the top. Do we have a fair allocation policy? Is it fit for purpose? Most of you who responded to the questionnaire uh, today have said you do have a policy, but it's worth reading and checking it. Who will have access to the data we will need to collect? If no one in chambers is allowed to look at earnings, how can we see if the affairs of chambers are being conducted fairly and equally? I don't think we can. The next step is to check that we're collecting and monitoring the right data. We at South Square focus on four data points. The first and most obvious is earnings. The second is high value work. And in most chambers, there is a particular stream of work which is more lucrative than other streams. We need to monitor that. The third is lead work. It can be a significant leg up for a junior and can considerably increase their earnings. And the fourth data point is advocacy opportunities. Once we have this data, we plug it into an Excel spreadsheet, which allows us to produce charts which can reveal trends and anomalies. I thought it might be helpful to show you two examples of the charts we produce and we circulate to all members. The data is fabricated, but you will get an idea of what everyone can see. So you don't need to be able to read anything, but the first chart shows how lead work opportunities are divided by juniors, between juniors. In an instant, you can see that some juniors are getting a great deal more work opportunities than others. Okay, the second chart a bit more, um, needs a bit more close examination, but I'll explain it to you. The second chart shows two things. The number of lead work cases per KC and the number of times they have led a particular junior. And when you look at this, you can very quickly see which KCs are leading the same juniors again and again. There is an excellent book called Nudge, um, which I... I hope uh, you will all go and have a look at after this meeting. And it explains how we can encourage people to change the way they behave. And the authors have identified two principal drivers of beh behavioral change. The first is information. If we're shown compelling information that suggests we should modify our behavior, it's likely that we will respond, we will respond to it with action. The second is our desire to conform. We have strong herd instincts, and where we can, we will tend to confer, conform with people in our group. We want to be seen to do the right thing. I want to highlight three approaches to nudging that we can use in chambers and which play on these instincts that we all have. The first is to make sure we provide decision makers with compelling and digestible information, such as the data from the Bar Council reports. We can also remind them of the legal duty we have to make sure our chambers allocate work fairly. 
The second approach is to show barristers and staff that influential people in chambers are already doing something about this. If there is someone in chambers who is widely respected, who is seen to lead on this initiative, others will tend to follow. The third approach is to circulate data which shows that most people in chambers are taking action to address the issue at hand. And those two charts are the sort of information I'm suggesting that we circulate. If we share the chart which shows, shows that KCs regularly lead different juniors, it will encourage those that repeatedly lead the same junior to expand their repertoire. The herd in instinct is strong and these um, genuinely do work. So I commend them to you. Mark, you're now going to talk about uh, visibility of earnings. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people believe that when people are talking about visibility of earnings, that a whole of chambers get an email once a week or once a month showing who's the highest earner and everything else that goes with it. That's not the case. Um, what I think everybody in chambers needs to establish is what level of visibility you actually want. Um, Will's just spoken about the visibility when it comes to fair allocation of work and how you need to have a financial indicator. That may well be your minimum. Um, and if the maximum is everyone has visibility on everyone's earnings annually, that's your, that's your top bracket. There's a lot there in between you can play with. And I actually think there will be a lot, lot of people and a lot of chambers that have some form of visibility already. So you will have a management committee that has visibility on earnings, fair allocation of work committee. You might have an equality and diversity committee that has that sort of visibility. So I can't see why we can't investigate that data that you already have. It should be being done. Um, I've been asked in other meetings and by other EDOs, what they can do. I know that there was one in particular which was quite distressing when they were asked to come up with a fair allocation of work policy and find out if there was any issues in relation to earnings, but then immediately told by their senior clerk and the head of chambers that they can't have any vision on what others are earning. So how they were supposed to solve that problem, I don't know. Um, and a lot of us now work with some sort of split in chambers. That might be teams, okay? Thanks. <laughs> might be teams. It might be call groups. So there is a way for you to be able to show data on what the average earnings are and compare them to the individual barrister if they want to know. Um, I've worked in two sets which have got full visibility on annual earnings. And what I can say about it in a positive way is they were not afraid to have a conversation about money. They were not afraid to ask questions about why they weren't earning potentially as much as somebody else. And then it was down to me and the other team clerks to ensure that we had an honest conversation about what they could do to improve or improve their earnings, sorry, not necessarily their practice. Um, the last thing, just before Rachel throws the phone at me, um, <laughs> is that visibility is not always just about earnings. It is actually about ensuring people know what to do or how to do it. So you can signpost your policies in chambers you can let people know where information is that you are able to put out there. As Will says, it might be a graph or two. Um, and you certainly can, I don't know, do a newsletter to show what marketing people are doing so that others have the opportunity to join in and actually and help help their vision or help their visibility in the market. Uh, I don't want to, I can't go on too much longer. So. Can I just say one thing? Um, I want to finish on one, one thought, and it's this. In a recent report by Deloitte about the pros and cons of transparency in organizations, the overriding message was that we're, there is no solution that fits all organizations. And we, um, I think, need to consider that when we're looking at what chambers are asked to do. What they say is rather than best practice, go for best fit. Okay, do what works for your chambers. That's, that's, yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much. I'm going to stay seated. Last but definitely not least, Sharon Blackman OBE, who is the global head of service legal at Citibank, who will tell us something about what that global organization is doing uh, with this issue. Thanks, Sharon. Um, so, what is City doing in this space? Well, we as a global financial services institution were perhaps um, quite eager, is perhaps one way of describing it, to publish our 
um, data. And maybe that's something to do with us being a US institution. Um, we published our gender pay gap um, information quite early on in the ask and were early also from a UK perspective to be willing to do the work and publish the data. I'm not overly surprised at that because our vision, mission statements and all the rest of it kind of like lean into this idea that given our global footprint as an organization, which is vast, we operate in, in excess of 100 countries worldwide, diversity is seen as one of our strengths. And that's beyond obviously the geographic and very highly plays into that idea of um, gender diversity. That said, the record within financial services generally around um, diversity, probably of any ilk, is not the best. Um, what has been helpful, I think, from a UK perspective has been the regulatory focus, which has definitely supported people focusing their minds on the issue at hand, being more willing to not only collect and collate data, but also to interrogate the data. What else have we done? We've insisted that um, seniors within our ranks have, I hesitate to say targets, but they have quite clear objectives in what we call their scorecard, which deals with how we think that they should approach their work beyond simply achieving the economic goals and supporting the business in um, achieving and driving their economic goals. And I think having the scorecard at the senior level, and as I've seen it pushed down to the next level of management, that has had quite an impact because the starting point beyond the data has got to be a willingness to have a conversation about the issue at hand. And if there's no conversation being had, then it's unlikely that there's any change being driven. After the scorecards were pushed down to our senior managers, that was probably one of the first times that I've heard absolute open conversation because now it hit the financial bottom line of our seniors. They weren't simply being evaluated on how many billions they'd brought into the organization. And also post-crisis, if you think about the focus of the regulators on risks and controls, one thing that was clearly identified was that a lack of diversity in its broadest sense played heavily into the risk decisions that organizations took. And therefore it was quite important that for a host of reasons, but those which also lead to the most fundamental reason why a bank may exist, that diversity is considered in all its aspects and in all the places where the bank operates. So what do I draw from what I've seen and what I've heard? I would agree with a lot of the things that people have said around the need to collate data and the need to interrogate data. I think it's been very important to understand that the tone from the top is key. If our CEO says X is the direction of travel, the next is the direction of travel. But what we cannot as an institution miss within that is what we call the murky middle, where that conversation, that statement gets somewhat watered down as it passes through the layers that constitute our 250,000 strong employee foothold. That's a lot of people to deliver a message to. So not just the tone from the top, but how you engage the middle. Asking them to report, really important. 
making it visible, our guys are uber competitive. So there's no way that you're going to have the head of the markets business outdone in his um, efforts to achieve his scorecard as against the head of the services business. It's not going to happen or it's not going to happen easily. So I think that speaks to playing to people's natural, I want to say predilections, but maybe that's the wrong word. <laughs> <laughs> but you understand where I'm going with that point. Um, I think it's worthwhile circling back on, well, two more things that probably are worthwhile um, discussing. We also put in place a lot of um, initiatives to support women. One comment that I would say around flexible working, whilst I get it that it's incredibly useful, in all of the conversations that I've been in, I've been at pains to tell people that if they label flexible working as a female point, then you are absolutely losing the argument right at the beginning of the conversation. It's not a female point. It's a family point. It's a well-being point. Please dress it up as anything else, but please do not make it a female point. Because all you do, or my observation of what you do in that instance, is you offer an opportunity to allow the gap to widen, both for opportunity and then for pay. I think fundamentally what I think is um, the key differentiator that we've observed is in seniority. Because when we did our data, what we identified was that overall, there's clearly, um, there's clearly a pay gap. But when you look level for level, that pay gap is really quite small. Where the pay gap was showing at its most was the lack of senior women. When you look at who was entering the organization, actually quite a lot of um, women entering at the junior levels, but we then added targets, a target of 50% recruitment into the organization at the graduate level. We then added other methods and opportunities for women and underrepresented groups more generally to join the organization and get the support perhaps transferring from other areas um, of business into financial services as a first step, but ensuring that we offer them the support to allow them to excel. Um, what have I missed? What do I need to say in addition? It has been impactful. It has moved the dial whether it's moved the dial fast enough, I don't think we can, I don't think that's one that's up for debate. It hasn't, but it is moving the dial forward. We have hit all of our UK targets, but that simply means that it's time to put in place some stretch targets and some stretch goals. That does become harder as the economy tightens but City at least have made a commitment to ensure that this remains an objective for us, which we intend to follow through on. Um, what would I say in closing? It's a journey. I think that change in culture is really, really important and it's not to be underestimated. Even if the tone from the top is of the correct nature, sometimes it just doesn't penetrate. And in those instances, you need to understand what the carrot is and what the stick is. And what that is for chambers is somewhat different, I suspect, to what that might be in an employed scenario. I think the final thing I'm going to reiterate really is about the regulatory focus. <coughs> Given Given what we're seeing across the world and particularly across the pond, I think it can't be underestimated that our regulators are 
in some ways holding our feet to the flame about how we operate in this space. Oh, Barbara's looking at me meaningfully, actually, because there's one more point. There's one more point. There's one more point to be made before I yeah forget. The other thing I think which is different about the um, about city, about the employed bar, about commerce was that we have a supplier diversity program where when we contract with suppliers, which would include our law firms, we ask them to value align with us. We identify for them what we think is really important for them to reflect in their organizations and how we expect them to behave. And it covers many things, modern slavery, ESG, all of those things. But we think gender diversity fits very neatly within that area. We ask our vendors, our third parties to be 15% diverse, to um, report to us on a quarter quarterly basis what that diversity looks like for our law firms that means that we ask them to tell us when they pitch who did you bring to the pitch what did that pitch look like and then if you were awarded the work what did you then do having pitched to us in a way that value aligned did you then staff with value aligned people we also ask that their suppliers are 15% diverse. And I think that is the key really for the bar, that you should be aware that we are looking beyond where we contract directly. We're looking at our law firms and we are increasing and continuing to ask them not just about who they feel to us and how they treat their staff. We're also asking them, who do you engage with in the fulfillment of the contracts that we put in front of you and the work that we give to you? And we're increasingly empowered to say that if you are not value aligned, then that is going to cause us a problem. She dropped the mic. Um, before I open the floor to questions, we often talk about the directories and the impact they have in this space. And we're very lucky to have Will Torsha here. So Will, if you don't mind coming forward and giving us a few words about what you're doing with the directories. Hello, everybody. It's uh, great to have heard the uh, perspectives from the uh, panel. I'll be focusing my commentary just on the uh, directory side of things, but it's been a really interesting conversation. It's been uh, great to hear from you all and great to see so many of you here. One issue that's typically come up a fair bit on the conversation of how legal directories represent women at the bar has been the vexed issue of quotes. We're proud of the fact that the quotes in the legal 500 directory, every single one of them comes from a real client a real opponent, a real person out there. Therefore, we do have limited control over what they say. However, we do try to nudge. We try to make it quite clear that what we're looking for from our referees is a quote about advocacy. If we get one of them, we will use that. However, we will always focus on making sure that if we do have a usable quote, it will be that. We do see client care as a valuable skill, but we share your pain about some of the quite generic quotes that you do wind up seeing about female barristers. So we will try to really wring the spreadsheet of all these quotes go into to make sure that we have none of as few of these quotes as possible and please bear that in mind when you are providing references yourselves that uh, sort of you're providing a nice quote focusing on advocacy. When it comes to participation in the rankings, one thing that I would always make clear is that it is in the interests of everyone in chambers that everyone in your chambers succeeds and by participating. 
there have been some suggestions about parental leave, and I'm aware that there's always a degree of um, uncertainty as to how some areas work in legal directory. It seemed, but let me make this clear. If you mention that a barrister has been on parental leave recently, we will protect their rank. It's as simple as that. If, they're, if you're on parental leave and they haven't been ranked in the past, please submit them, even if their work was outside the time period, we will, we will take that into account. Can you be promoted while on parental leave? Yes. Does it apply when returning, even if it's slightly, slightly before the time period we're looking for? Yes. Does this apply to male barristers who have been on strict chair parental leave? Yes. Do we protect female clerks? Yes. Make this clear in the submissions and we will bear this in mind. Also, if the solicitor who you want to put down as a referee has been on parental leave, by the by, there's no harm putting another member of the team. We treat this as very much a team exercise. I completely agree with what Sharon said about if you start seeing flexible working as a female issue, you're losing that part of the battle. It's a family issue. However, if as the subject's been raised, I feel I should make something clear. We're conscious of the fact that there are that it's, it's something that hasn't necessarily been baked into the process before, but it is now. We appreciate that the bar is a unique environment. It's so trying to squash it into a structure of working days is not necessarily the a completely accurate thing, but it's something that we have effectively got to do in order to have some sort of rough yardstick. Therefore, we do have flexibility for those who are able to provide perhaps fewer case highlights. Again, make this clear in the evidence submissions process, and we will ensure that that is borne in mind. I'm conscious of the fact that I'm standing in between you and questions, so I'll leave it there. So uh, thank you very much, and I uh, look forward to hearing what we have to ask these wonderful speakers about. So um, please join me in thanking our amazing panellists who've given up their time. To share their time. Yeah, and before before we have some drinks and refreshments, I think you want to have a quick word. So good evening, everyone. It's a travesty, isn't it, that we are having a conversation in 2024 about gender pay inequality and that it is worsening. Um, but on behalf of the Inns of Court Women's Alliance, I would like to thank Barbara and all the panellists, Susanna, Sharon, Mark and Will, because they have given some hope that they not only appreciate the acute problems, but they are effecting some real change in practice. And certainly sitting here this evening, it seemed to me that there were four key points from this. One is interrogating the data, not just having the data, but interrogating it. Two, the need for transparency. Three, the need for conversations. And four, the importance of cascading down. So can I ask everyone this evening to give Barbara and the panel uh, appreciation for this evening and highlighting the travesty that is still there for the profession. Thank you.